going to be reading from Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. We're going to jump right into it. Are you ready? Are you ready to hear the word of God this morning? How about we stand in honor of God's word as we read the scripture this morning? I know you just sat down, but it's okay. Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1. We're going to read 1 through 12. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. These are some good friends. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Verse five, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Are you thankful for those words? Your sins are forgiven. Verse six, but some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or is it easier to say, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I'll prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man. In verse 11, he says, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out, this, uh, walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. Look at your neighbor say, there's another door. There's another door. God, we thank you so much for bringing us into this place. Lord, if you did nothing else, you've already done enough for us. But God, we pray that you would invade this space, that you would inhabit the praises of your people, Lord, that you would be here in this moment, and that when I would speak, they would be your words and not my own. Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you're gonna do today. We love you. We trust you. We are amazed by your goodness, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can like air high five someone or high five someone if you're comfortable with that. Give them a fist bump, whatever, and then you can take a seat. Today, we are continuing the series that we started last week called Radical Jesus. Did Pastor Nathan do an incredible job last week kicking off this series? I'm so excited. He said at the beginning of it, we have no idea how long this series is going to go. It's just one of those things. We're going to start talking about it until God tells us to move on. But today, we are going to start with part two, and we are in the book of Mark. So the book of Mark was written by a man named Mark, but it was written on the account of of Peter. And so Jesus is in this house and he's preaching. And the Bible says, we pick up in verse two, it says, soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. Say, there's another way in. There's another way in. If I were going to give you a sermon in a sentence, if, if you wrote nothing else down, I'm not saying do that. You should write every single thing down that I say. But <laughs> Write this down. Life's biggest opportunities aren't always obvious. Life's biggest opportunities aren't always obvious. We want God to show up in the obvious. Like, God, I need you to move on my behalf, and all of a sudden the clouds open up, there's a ray of light beaming down on you, and you know for certain this is what God wants for your life. But it doesn't work like that. It wasn't obvious to my wife, that I was a man of her dreams. It took some convincing. I worked hard at it, y'all. Can I be real a second? For just a millisecond. Let down my guard and tell the people how I feel a second. Some people, you, some of you got that. I had to work hard. It wasn't obvious to her that I was the man she needed to be with. By the way, ladies, this isn't in the sermon. But if your man ain't working hard to win your heart, what makes you think he's going to work hard to keep it? Come on. But no matter how obvious, irrelevant, no matter how obvious I made it, she didn't know that I was her man, but obviously it worked out. It wasn't obvious to Moses that he was going to deliver the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery. Moses 
was a common man. He had a, he had a speech impediment. He had his own struggles. About, he, even, he even murdered someone. It wasn't obvious that God was going to use him. And Moses said, God, I need a sign that this is what you want from me. God was like, all right, throw your stick on the ground. He threw the stick on the ground. It turned into a snake. Life's biggest opportunities are not always obvious, Moses, but I'm going to use what's common to point you to your calling. I'm already preaching in case you, you were still in the introduction section. God disguises calling as common. I'll say it again. God disguises calling as common. Jesus didn't come to the earth as a reigning king for all to see. No. How did he come? In the form of a baby, common. David did not know on this day that he was going to be facing Goliath the Philistine that would be the turning point in David's life where God could begin to use him. He didn't realize it because he was just delivering food to the front line of the battle. Somebody say, common. It wasn't obvious to me when I was building chairs and driving Uber to put myself through Bible school. It wasn't obvious to me that God had a calling on my life at this point. It may not be obvious Single mom, when you go another day buying groceries, working two jobs, keeping the house clean, it may not be obvious that those kids are arrows in your quiver and you've been given the task, the privilege, the opportunity, the bow to point them in the right direction. It may not be obvious. It may not be obvious that the job application was denied because God was protecting you from something you didn't even know about. It may not be obvious, teenager, when that guy or girl breaks your heart, that if you would have stayed with them, you may never have seen God's purpose on your life. It may not be obvious because life's biggest opportunities are not always obvious. It wasn't obvious that Jesus was the savior of the world when he was hanging on a tree, taking his final breath. It wasn't obvious. Can I encourage you this morning? After all, I think that's why we come here. Resurrection always feels like death before it happens. Extraordinary looks an awful lot like ordinary before you see the miracle, it's not always obvious. So Jesus is teaching, and it says, while he was preaching God's word to them, I don't know about you, but I think I would have liked to sit under a Jesus sermon. Like, this is probably like top of the line. I mean, the Bible says, I am the word. So can you imagine the word preaching the word, and you're hearing the words that he's saying because he is? Anyway, that's how my mind... I'm sorry, when I read scripture, my mind interjects all the time. It's just, it's just how, just bear with me. So when he was preaching God's word to them, verse three, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. These four men are legends. They are champions. There's a whole message in this. You need four people. That's all you need. You need four people. I don't know how long they carried this man, but regardless, they carried their friend to Jesus because they heard that Jesus was preaching. And so this is why that's important. Sometimes you need people to get you into the presence of Jesus when you don't feel like getting there or you are incapable of getting there yourself. You need people who are gonna go, no, Jared, I'm picking up your mat and I'm carrying you to church because you need to be there. So they get to the first door, and that's what I want you to write down, the first door, number one, disappointment. Anybody ever been to the door of disappointment? Raise your hands. Come on, we're all in this together. Anybody ever been to the door of disappointment? M many of us are all too familiar with door number one. Another day, I'm still depressed, disappointment. Another day, I'm still single, disappointment. I'm without work disappointment. Another day, 
another disappointment. And what I've learned is this is where most people would turn around and go home. Hear me. They get to the door. They can't get in. So obviously it's not God's will for him to be healed. Too many people think this way. I don't like the way that church sings their songs. So obviously it's not God's will for me to be here. So I'm just gonna walk away and abandon the purpose that God had on my life. I didn't get accepted to the school I wanted. So obviously education isn't for me. Well, we went to counseling, but we're still fighting. So obviously this marriage isn't going to work out. We did not carry you all this way to take no for an answer. I didn't come this far. I didn't make it through what I made it through. I didn't spend all this time and all this energy into this marriage. I did not come this far to let it die here. So they get to the door. And it doesn't take much of an observation to see that. This is not the way they're going in. It's crowded, it's packed, there's people everywhere. I imagine they're in the living room. I don't, I don't know the house that this was used at, but I imagine Jesus and all the people are in the living room. They get to the door, they can see in, but they can't get in. So they take their eyes, don't miss this, they take their eyes and they look up. They can't get in, they look up. They can't get in, they look up. Say, there's another way. Hear me. Maybe the reason you couldn't get into the ground level is because God is trying to take you higher. He doesn't want you to settle for what's down here because what he has for you is up there. So they had to lift their eyes. I lift my eyes to the hills where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So don't confuse God's higher calling by thinking it's going to be easy. Not only do they have to carry this man however far, but now they've got to get him on a roof. There were no escalators or elevators at this time. They have to get him up there, but it doesn't stop there. Once they're up there, they have to make a door. So what I'm trying to get to you, what I'm trying to convey to you this morning is that faith requires action. Faith requires action. Faith without works is dead. Faith requires action. And so many of us, and I've been guilty of this too, suffer from what you may have heard called analysis paralysis. Anybody lived here? Maybe God's put a business idea on your mind. Maybe he's put something you have to create, something he's given you, a vision, an idea God has given you. So you watch another YouTube video, you listen to another podcast, you find another devotional that has to do with what you're trying to do, but then you justify not doing anything because you did a lot today because you watched a YouTube video. Analysis, paralysis. Faith is a response that you can see to something that cannot be seen. Faith is getting to the house of God even though I don't feel like it. Faith is walking out into the world without fear, even though everything in the world is telling me to be afraid. Faith is not a feeling. You can't see a feeling. You see the expression of a feeling. Verse six, excuse me, verse five. Seeing their faith. Are you still with me? Then let me know it. Are you still there? Seeing their faith. Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. I want you to circle or highlight or underline that word seeing, seeing their faith. It was saw, Jesus Jesus saw it, seeing their faith. By the way, these four friends are great friends because they refused to give up. They didn't let their faith stop in here and in here. They actually took action. And by the way, Jesus isn't particularly healing on this day. This isn't like a tent revival where Jesus is like, bring all your sick and we're going to pray over them and they're going to be healed. No, he's simply teaching when all of a sudden, (laughs) they don't have power tools, but (laughs) dirt starts falling from the ceiling. Like what in the world is happening in this house? So what's funny to me is there's actually another account of this in the book of Matthew. This is Matthew 
chapter nine. And I'll tell you why it's funny, but let me read it first. Matthew 9, 2. It says, some people brought, uh, brought to him, brought to Jesus a paralyzed man on a mat. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, be encouraged, my child, your sins are forgiven. So this seems very like faith-filled. They, they brought the man on the mat, and Jesus saw their faith, and he healed them. But what about the part where the roof was ripped off at the top of the building? The book of Mark was written by Mark by the account of Peter, and many scholars believe that this was Peter's house because Matthew talks about faith, and Peter is like, and they started tearing up the roof. So Jesus, seeing this, he says, I see your faith, and your sins are forgiven. But here's what's interesting about this, and I want you to take note. This is very interesting. His sins are forgiven, but they didn't bring him to have his sins forgiven. They brought him for healing. So the question there is, what do you do when God bypasses what you want to give you what you need? That relationship you thought you wanted, that career you thought you wanted, what do you do when God says no to that because he has something else for you? The most obvious thing to do would have been to heal the man. He's obviously, he, he can't walk. He's on a mat. His friends carried him in. But maybe God is saying, before I do anything for you, I want to do something in you. In the words of pastor, I'm preaching better than you're amen in. God, thank you for forgiving my friend, but he's still on the mat. And maybe that's where you are right now. You're still on the mat. You're still crippled by Whatever situation you find yourself in, maybe something was done to you that you had no control over, you had zero control over, but now you're crippled and you're on a mat. So look what happens in verse six. Some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there said to themselves, or excuse me, thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Verse eight, Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. I want you to listen. The faith of the friends is what got this guy forgiven. But it was the opposition. It was the restriction. It was the critics that got him healed. Can we thank God for those things in our life that we thought we needed but really stopped us from moving forward? Can we just thank God for just a second for removing that toxic person out of my life who would have hindered everything God was trying to do in me? Thank God for the hardships. Paul says, I rejoice in the hardships. That's the next one, opposition. Write that down, opposition. And what I've learned is that many times we think opposition is our enemy, right? Like we don't like resistance. That's why so many of us have a hard time getting to the gym. We don't, we, we don't like opposition. We don't like obstacles or resistance, but it's not always the enemy. Could it be that God is trying to do something in your life, Paul? Paul said, I'm gonna I'm ask him three times, God, remove this thorn from my flesh. And God was like, no, 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 no. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is all you need. A second time, God, remove this thorn from me. No, no, no. My grace is sufficient for you. Maybe the fact that the devil has unleashed all of hell on your life is because all of heaven is on your life and he is getting desperate because God's hand is on your life. So I want you to know that just because because you face some opposition does not mean that you are not in the will of God. It could mean that's exactly where you are, right in the will of God. When the game's on the line and this fourth and go and there's no time left on the clock, they give the ball to the person who can shoulder it. If there was no resistance, you could not be resilient. My God. I thank God for my struggle. I thank God for my heartache. I thank God for the darkness I walked through because if I didn't know the darkness, I wouldn't recognize the light. But now that I've been through the darkness, I can look to the light and say, my God. 
I don't deserve your goodness. But you give it to me. Anyway, somebody say, there's another way. There's another door. The biggest battles are reserved for those with the greatest purpose on their life. Hear that, please. The biggest battles are reserved for those who have the biggest purpose on their life. God can use that opposition to bring healing, not only in your life, but in those who need to see it. Verse 10, so I will prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, walked through the, the stunned onlookers, and they were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. Here's the next one, obedience. Write that down. Obedience. This man played a part in his miracle. Any other day, any other person, this is a simple command. Get up. Okay. But for this man, it was an impossible situation. Do you find yourself in an impossible situation right now? Can you trust God in a seemingly impossible situation where you see nothing working, you've been praying, you've been believing, you've been spending time with God, but yet you see nothing happening, you've been walking around the wall six times and no brick has fallen down? Can you trust God in an impossible situation? God did not give him a how-to. This man had been paralyzed for all we know all his life. We don't, he, he didn't get a how-to on how to walk. Put your right foot, that's my left foot, put your left foot, you're right. He didn't have an instruction manual. And so often, man, I'm preaching to myself right now. So often, we want the answers before moving forward. But more often than not, that's not how God operates. Because where would your faith be? Sometimes God's just giving you a step, and that's all you can see. Everything else is dark, but you see this step. And you say, God, I don't know exactly what you have for me, but I see this step, so I'm going to take it. Sometimes that's how God works. And this is what this man had to do. He had to do something off of two words. Stand up. Stand up. Church, you say you have faith. Faith is not expressed in your Facebook posts. Share if you love Jesus. If not, you're going to hell. You. Faith is expressed through your works. You are not saved by works. But once you are saved, your faith is a demonstration of what God has done in your life. And the best declaration is a demonstration. You want to point people to God? Live your life by faith. Walk by faith. Don't walk in fear. Walk in victory. Take the step. Stand up. Pick up your mat and go home. Jesus said, he didn't say, if you can stand up, stand up. He said, if you will stand up, you can get up. If you will, I squeaked, if you will forgive that person, you can forgive that person. If you will take courage, you can have courage. By the way, it's not like this man was in the comfort of his own living room. It wasn't like he was by himself in an intimate moment with Jesus where no one was watching. He was in a room with people who did not want him there. And by the way, he tore up a house to get there. And in the Jewish culture, people equated sin with suffering. So this man must be a sinner because he's suffering. Or he must be suffering because he has sin in your life. So maybe you're here and everyone knows your business. Everyone understands and knows the decisions that you have made. Are you willing to stand up for your healing in the face of conflict, in the face of doubt, in the face of criticism? Will you stand? Are you willing to stand up in the face of adversity? Will you get up? 
The last one, Revelation. Not the book of the Bible, but a revelation. It was through this man's miracle that the crowd had a revelation of who Jesus was. They weren't amazed by his friends tearing off a roof. They were actually probably pretty upset about it. They weren't amazed by Jesus saying, your sins are forgiven. Anyone could say that. They were amazed that he got up. When they saw what Jesus did in this man's life, they were astonished, the Bible says. So my question to you today is who needs your story? Who in your life is that crowd waiting in anticipation for you to stand up, pick up your mat, and walk out? You've been paralyzed long enough. You've suffered from analysis paralysis long enough. It's time to move forward. Who needs to see your marriage get stronger? Who needs to see you parent well? Who needs to see you come through the storm? Who needs it? Your pain, your heartache is not just for you. Once you come through it, you now have a task, a responsibility, a divine calling to help other people who have struggled with the same thing you're struggling with and say, look, I know it's dark right now. I know you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, but this is not the end. This will not take you out with the devil meant for harm. God will turn for good. I know I'm shouting because this is something I've lived through and I can't help but shout. I can't preach this message like this. And God will deliver you from your darkness. I can't do it. I won't do it because God has done so much in my life and I refuse to stay quiet about it. Yes. Many of us have been through so much and I know I'm not alone. I know people in this room under the sound of my voice who have struggled, who have, who have dealt with some heartache in their life. Maybe right now you're even dealing with this. But God has delivered you from something and you have yet to tell your story. Can I ask you, what are you waiting for? The moment I realized that people could come to Jesus because of something I had to endure, it made it worth it. It changed my perspective. So who can be helped by your miracle? Because someone needs to know what God has done in your life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 9 of John chapter 10 says, I am the door. Say, there's another way. There's another door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Jesus said, I stand at the door and I knock anyone opens, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Is Jesus knocking on your door this morning? Maybe that's, that's the door you need to walk through right now. If you're like me, maybe you've thought, I'm, I'm too messed up. You have no idea the things I've had to walk through or the decisions that I've made. There's no way God can accept me. That's backwards. It's backwards. Jesus said, come to me as you are. Come to me, all you are heavy and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light, Jesus says. It's not about your works. It's not about what you can or can't do. It's about what Jesus did for you by becoming the door to salvation. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's not a matter of what you can or can't do. In fact, Paul said if, if it were up to us to receive our salvation, then Jesus would have died for nothing. But we can't. We can't earn it. Jesus offers it to us. And it comes wrapped in a gift. It's called grace. It simply means undeserved favor. When I look back on my life, the things I've dealt with, the decisions I've made, if it wasn't for the grace of God, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I would not be standing here right now talking to you. So it's nothing that you can do to earn it. 
or work harder or try more. You just accept it. And then the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit in your life begins to work out things and begins to replace things in your life that you don't need with things that you do need. He begins to change your heart. It's not my job to change your heart. It's God's. It's my job to present it to you. But I can't change your heart. Only God can do that. And so if that's you this morning and you want to make that decision, I'm going to give you that opportunity right now. In fact, can we just stand up all around the room? As we wrap up the service today, I want to give you an invitation to accept Jesus into your life with every eye closed and every head bowed. John 3, 16 said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. If you would just believe in him, you would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's all you have to do. That's the, that's the, it's, it's faith. You just have to believe it. So if that's you, I'm going to count to three and I want you to Raise your hand if you wanna make that decision today or maybe you've made it a long time ago but you know your relationship is not where it needs to be. You know some of the things that you've had to walk through. I can hear God saying to you right now, come back home, I forgive you. So if that's you, I'm gonna count to three. I want you to slip up your hand wherever you are. One, two, three. If you wanna make that decision this morning, I see those hands, God bless you. I see those hands, God bless you, I see you, I see you. Anybody else all around the room? I see you. God bless you. I see you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Thank you, God. I see you. Thank you, God. I see you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Church, can we just put our hands together for all those making decisions right now? The heart change that's taking place right now. The Bible says when one sinner comes to know Christ, all of heaven rejoices. And so I want to say a prayer. And I want you to repeat this prayer after me. There's nothing magic about this prayer. It's an act of faith. And when you say it and you believe it, that's when Jesus comes into your life according to scripture. So let's pray this day. Dear God, I invite you into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Take away my past. Give me a new start. Thank you for dying for me and raising from the grave. I love you. I'll trust you. I'll follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, come on. Can we lift an ovation for those who just made that decision this morning? We are so proud of you. God bless you.